Welcome to ProPractice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's tutorial will be covering the Mazurka in A minor, Opus 17, number 4, by Frédéric Chopin. This beautiful work was part of the set of Opus 17 mazurkas written between 1832 and 1833 and published in 1834. This was the first set that he wrote after leaving Poland and settling in France. This beautiful work really embodies nostalgia, longing, homesickness, and there's a lot of ambiguity in this piece. Before we dive into the tutorial portion, I thought I would just play the first 20 bars of this piece to give you a little insight into what the piece sounds like in case you aren't already familiar with it. I'm guessing you are if you're here on this tutorial, but in case you're not, here we go. repeat of that. If you would like, you can think of this piece as a large ABA. As I dug into more research, uh, it's in the form of a dance poem. Um, so you do see things that wouldn't hold up in an ABA section, such as this bar 37. Um, but we keep seeing this, think of it, uh, as a stanza in a poem, we keep seeing this main theme, this main musical motif come back. It comes back in 21 where we just left off. Each time with a little bit of embellishment, each time with the beautiful improvisatory fioratura, um, these just differing ever so slightly. Some of them repeat exactly. Then we arrive on this A major section. So if you like to, you can think of the A section repeating several times uh, this main musical motif. And then you can think of this as your B section, which repeats several times. And then we're back to A. And then finally in bar uh, 109, well, I guess it's 108, it, we cadence here, we see a little coda, which is highly chromatic. Let's talk, for, so that's just a general layout. Again, I don't think I would call this ternary, like if you're sitting in a doctoral exam, <laughs> you would probably call this a dance poem form, um, but just for organizational purposes and for you to get a general layout of the piece, I do think it helps to say, here's the A, here's the repeat of A, here's a little contrasting section from bar 37 over to bar 44, and then we see that same uh, A section come back. And then, oh, we're in the B section now because it's seems to pick up the tempo slightly. He doesn't indicate to pick up the tempo, but that definitely has a more lively, optimistic feel to it. And this is so yearning and sorrowful and nostalgic and melancholic. So as you're first learning that, I, I like to put just a mental map um, to work to help me memorize it, to help me notice differences from those iterations of the repeated material, or the iterations of that same material. And overall, we can start dissecting key areas as well, and how this piece is quite strange. One thing I didn't talk about is the introductory bars, the first four bars, what in the world is happening? Didn't we say this piece was in A minor? It's very strange. You think, okay, if we end here, maybe it's F major, but we um, we start with a B natural, so it's not going to be F major. So 
that would we would have a B flat if we were in F major. So it's very ambiguous, and I think that lends to the nostalgia, to the reminiscing of the past, to the longing, the homesickness, as we said. Um, Chopin yearned to go back to Poland and was sad to leave his family. I've been to that beautiful Chopin Museum in Warsaw, and you can see his handwritten letters and his notebooks, um, these, these letters to his family. Um, and I think that we want to embody that in our interpretation of the piece. So that gives you just a general overlay of the piece. I always like to try to do that to give you some semblance of organization before we dig in. Let's start out with the elephant in the room. How in the world do we voice this? Middle line. There are several ways to voice. I've gone over all of these extensively on the channel, and there's others. We just had a tutorial from one of my good friends, a guest tutorial, and he presented voicing in a way that I hadn't presented it before. So many people present this differently. The best way that I've personally found uh, that's helped me the most is something that Susan Duhlmeyer, my beloved, amazing, lifelong teacher, um, gave me when I was nine years old. We were working on this Chopin A2. Maybe I was 10 or 11 at this point, but... She said, okay, I want you to go home and I want you to play forte on your melody and pianissimo and staccato on the other voices. So we're gonna do the exact same thing here. This takes a little bit of getting used to, especially since the melody is buried between two voices. So this is, this is pretty awkward. What you're getting used to by doing that exercise is getting used to having a little bit more weight or speed or emphasis on this note. And you can do it very square and rigid and vertical to start with just to get that sensation in the hand and then we'll add some shape to it in a moment. That's my favorite way. A couple of other ways that have been presented to me over the years. Um, one way is uh, to think of one finger protruding further down than the others. This is a very dangerous way of thinking about it because you can easily get ghost notes. But for some reason, this clicks with certain students. So if it clicks with you, awesome. If it messes you up, ditch it. Don't, don't worry about it. But just thinking of th that fourth finger protruding a little lower, That can help. And additionally, one other way, my, one of my students um, presented this to me is he said, oh, when I'm trying to voice well, I think of my voiced note being uh, the, the finger that is playing the voice note is made of metal or some hard substance. And the others are just feathers stroking the keys or pliable rubber or something very soft. I think a lot of voicing can be guided by mental pathways. So it's not just, oh, my hand can voice well or it can't. It's trying to find the mental unlock. Another way that others have presented it is to displace. So just to get used to that, this is a, I personally just use that as a very preliminary exercise to get the students thinking this way because pretty soon they need to graduate on to playing the notes together. All right, that's enough of that. Work on that, don't get discouraged. Voicing is one of the most difficult things. I would work with masters and doctoral students all the time when I taught at the university on voicing and <laughs> how can we voice better. It's something that I always have to be very aware of. I'm working on some difficult material right now and that's one of my main focuses is how well am I voicing this? How much voicing of that melody do I want? Because it can have different effects based on how much you bring it out. Sometimes you don't want to bring it out incredibly obviously. Maybe it's um, more subtle and other times it's very obvious. Here I would be bring it out pretty obviously because you don't. Okay. Last thing about these first four measures um, before we get into the shaping of it is they're so ambiguous, and the piece starts 
and it also ends. So even at the end of that coda, Chopin easily could have done something like this and ended there, but instead he goes back. And it feels lost. Because we're not establishing a strong key area, we really don't know what key it's in until <laughs> we get down to maybe bar 13. But even then, <laughs> it's not really... It's kind of there, but then he infuses it with D minor there. So we, we hear a really strong cadence in bar 20, where I ended my little demonstration. Other than that, Chopin's kind of teasing us with ambiguity so far as key area. So we want the piece infused with that type of bewilderment, that type of um, yearning and searching for stability and not being able to necessarily find it. I do think we get a little reprieve in bar 61 when we go to this A major. This still has some movement and excitement and joy in it, but it feels more grounded. And it's in the key of A major, which is not always the first choice of composers for a contrasting section to go to the parallel major. That's quite jarring. You know, we just end. Um, and every other time we ended in A minor, and this time A major. So very... Uh, kind of a jarring key change there. It's not the most jarring you could have, but obviously it's not expected. So I'd like to get your mind set in a good place before we dive, and I do this with all my private students, before we dive into the mechanics of this, because if you have your mind in the right place, it will naturally guide you to make a lot of these decisions intuitively, rather than searching like, where do I go with this line? What, what a emotion am I trying to convey? All right, let's dive into maybe some rubato and shape. Here, because it is so ambiguous and it starts on this B natural, which is so dissonant with that A, I like to maybe ease into it just a little, very soft. And then maybe go to the middle and then diminuendo. Horowitz does something different. He does that which is also quite nice. The thing I just don't want you to do is stagnate. If I have an old recording of this um, that I recorded 14 or 15 years ago. I've changed a lot as a person and as a musician since then. It's a decent recording. Um, it's on my Gaspar CD. Um, it's a little too straight for my liking these days. Um, you know, it was a little bit more... A little bit like that. I like to infuse more rubato because I like this to have kind of a wistful um, hope amid the searching and the loss and the nostalgia. So crescendo, diminuendo. And we get this extremely lonely melody. Think of that as its own little miniature phrase. Chopin even writes it like that. One other little piece of significance is Chopin suspends that chord and just changes the C to a D. So that's tied. So I like to change my pedal there. You can reference the pedal cam there. And then change when we get to there. And you'll notice inconsistent pedalings on my part. Sometimes I will bleed pedals like that. Or if you like it cleaner, change, change. You're welcome to change more often. Here, I wouldn't change. I just, I don't think it's necessary, but here, I bleed it. I just keep it going. And then change, 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 because that'd be a little blurry. So just watch that pedal cam. That's why I introduced this pedal cam, so I don't have to dictate every pedal I'm doing. You can just reference it on your own. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up, and the fact that this is suspended to here. So we have... Da -da -da -da. And then this is kind of blurry into it. Don't change. I, I wouldn't change there. I would bleed that. Well, actually, that's a personal choice. You could change. But here, I personally kind of like, now that we're talking about it, I don't know if I did that the first time. I kind of like that. 
So and taking time, then going. One thing you don't want to do is elongate your short values too much. So don't go because that will almost set you up for failure. Like dum bum 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 bum. That's gonna set you up. Those subdivisions of one e and a two e and a, that's gonna make you stagnate. So always, almost over dot this. Don't double dot. You know, and make it weird and fidgety, but. And notice I have pretty free and liberal rubato in there. So time and then time. Finish that phrase and then go. And he marks an accent there. Do we want to go? I don't think so. Sometimes Chopin will write accents and sometimes, this is a specialized piece of information, um, but you can reference Seymour Bernstein's book and also the works of many famous composers, which clearly show that this is a thing. The uh, hairpin markings, um, we don't see a whole lot of those in this piece uh, as I'm looking through it, but sometimes those can indicate time as well as volume indications. Um, it's not just getting bigger. If he writes C-R-E-S-C, -E -S -E, you're gonna wanna get bigger. If he writes a hairpin opening, well, as the performer, maybe you interpret that as taking time. Maybe you interpret that as just getting louder or maybe a little bit of both. I do subscribe to that philosophy. Um, I'll just go on record saying that. I'm not subscribing to it everywhere, <laughs> but there have been too many instances in the music of Chopin and others that I've noticed that that really works. And I think just this little accent here, I think it's resolving, but a little bit of time there and then time there, then move on. He marks piano here, but I like to come up a little so I can come down there. Now, new breath, maybe a little more aggressive there or assertive, maybe not aggressive. And then less, take time. So as you develop your sense of rubato, the pushing and pulling of time, I want you to make sure to ask yourself, where is it gonna be best to take time? And maybe I'll take quite a bit of time rather than just being fairly straight, fairly flat. So.